Welcome to the Final Fantasy VII Iceberg. We're looking at nine whole layers of intrigue, mystery, and fun facts that are sure to come in handy even in the most dire of situations. I was shocked to find out nobody made an Iceberg video on this game yet, so I thought it was time for the chat to spring into action. Anyways, you clicked on this video, you probably know what you're getting into. You most likely already know who this dumbass is, and you probably know what an Iceberg chart is. But just in case you don't, or if you're my dad. It's a chart listing facts that range from common knowledge to some Alex Jones conspiracy theory type shit. Major shout out goes to the absolute mad lad that made the original iceberg image. Let's give it up for Reddit user, the strife is rife. Just so you know, this video is technically their fault. This is gonna be a long one, so let's not waste any more time and just jump right into the first layer. This guy are sick. Coming in first, we got the classic This Guy Are Sick. This is a famous typo in the localization of FF7 that occurs when you and Aerith encounter a sick man in the Midgar slums. This isn't the only typo in this video, so get hype. Yuffie and Vincent. Even though they're pretty popular characters, with Vincent getting an entire Shadow the Hedgehog ass side game on the PS2, they're actually optional characters that players could completely miss if they don't do their side quests. Aerith vs. Eris. This right here is a debate that has claimed the lives of many stinky gamers over the years. In the original localization of FF7, our girl went by Aerith because of what I assume to be a translation error relating to the katakana in her name. Most people claim that Aerith is the far more correct translation of her name. I personally think that Aerith rolls off the tongue a bit better, but she goes by Aerith in the remake, so that's what I'll be calling her in this video. No hard feelings, y'all. Hojo is Sephiroth's father. This is a piece of lore you find out about our boy, Sephiroth. While experimenting with the cells of Genova, a purple space monster, Dr. Hojo decided to inject her cells into his currently forming baby just to see what would happen. And of course, that created... That leads right into Lucrecia as Sephiroth's actual mom. Even though Sephiroth would shut the hell up about mommy Genova, the Shinra scientist Lucrecia as Sephiroth's real mom. Aerith dies, in a twist that was shocking back when it came out. Towards the halfway point of the game when you get to the City of the Ancients, Sephiroth swoops down and impales Aerith right through the chest and kills her right in front of you. I feel like it'd probably be a little bit more impactful if this part wasn't such common knowledge. I swear to God, before I knew what Final Fantasy VII was, I knew that this chick dies. Catch she. One of the mandatory party members in the game is this robotic cat named Ket Shi. Besides being a dumb bitch, this character is notable for the pronunciation of his name. Ket Shi isn't pronounced how it's spelled, Kate Sith. His name is actually Scottish Gaelic and is pronounced Ket Shi. I didn't even know that. I've been calling him Kate Sith my whole life. Alavoy. In the Spanish version of FF7, when Cloud talks to a worker at the Gold Saucer, he says muy bien Alavoy, even though Alavoy isn't even a real word. LTD, oh boy, LTD. <laughs> This is an abbreviation for the love triangle debate. If you're looking for sweat, this is the place to find it. It's an argument that has transcended decades and many message boards asking the big questions. Who did Cloud love more, Tifa or Aerith? Sephiroth is actually Genova most of the game. Yeah, before you find Sephiroth's regenerating body in the Northern Crater during the events of Disc 2, the Sephiroth you've been seeing up until that point was actually a vessel controlled by Genova. Be a cause. During a pivotal and dramatic moment in the game, there's a stupid ass typo that reads, be a cause, you are. A puppet. Be a cause is also the name of a popular translation of FF7 that corrects a lot of the mistakes of the original localization. Reviving Aerith. This was a very popular playground rumor that refers to being able to revive Aerith after her death. This, of course, has been proven false multiple times, and sorry to say it, buddy, unless you cop a Game Shark, Bay ain't coming back. Differences in the original Japanese version. The Western release of FF7 has a ton of changes made from the original Japanese version. Probably way too many to list in this video, but they include tweaking some of the mini games, a reduced random encounter rate, and just a bunch of quality of life improvements that make the game a bit less shitty. Gold Chocobo. The Gold Chocobo is the greatest Chocobo you can make in the Chocobo breeding mini game. It can go anywhere in the world map that you want, and it's required for some of the wacky late game secrets. If you're an impatient troglodyte like me, you can cheat the system and do all this really specific stuff and get it relatively easily. I'll slip a little tutorial in the description description for y'all if you're interested. Knights of the Round. This is the best summon in the game. It can be found in this little cave in the middle of the ocean that you need a golden chocobo to access. It hits the enemy 13 times, does a max damage of 129,987, and to top it all off, the animation takes about a minute and 20 seconds. Holy shit, that's pretty cool. Secret Zack Flashback. There's an extremely lore important flashback that entire games and anime are based off of that can be completely missed if you aren't looking in the right place. If you go to the Shinra Mansion basement on disc 3, Cloud will have a flashback of his final moments with Zack when they escape the lab. 
Chocobo Chick Nest. I'm pretty sure this is referring to a bird nest on the Mount Corral train tracks. If you choose to take the treasure, you are pushed into a fight with a Coquitolis enemy, which rewards you with 10 whole ass Phoenix Dance. All Lucky Sevens. This is a secret battle status that occurs if a party member's HP lands on exactly 7,777. Every subsequent attack they deal will be 7,777 damage until that character's HP changes. I mean, this has never happened to me, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool. Professor Gas Tapes. In the Icicle Inn, if you enter this one house, you can watch tapes that give some well-needed backstory for Aerith's parents. Her father, Gast, was a scientist working for Shinra, who fell in love with the last surviving Cetra, Ifalna. It's too bad Pops over here ends up killing Gast and capturing Ifalna and their newborn Aerith. Aerith and Yuffie date scenes. On the trip to the Gold Saucer in Disc 1, the player can go on a date with Aerith, Tifa, Yuffie, or Barret. What's interesting about Barret and Yuffie in particular is that they're the hardest characters to date because of how low their love stats start at. Emerald and Ruby Weapon. These are two of the big ass kaiju monsters that are activated halfway through the game along with diamond, sapphire, and ultimate. The two are optional super bosses that are the hardest fights in the game. Find the house at Costa del Sol. When the party enters Costa del Sol, Cloud can optionally purchase his very own penthouse for the low low price of 300,000 gil. It serves practically no purpose in the game as far as I'm aware. Versus Guide. This refers to an unofficial strategy guide written by Casey Lowe and published by Versus Books that's famously way more in depth than the official guides for the game. It's got all this cool ass artwork that makes it an interesting guide to flip through for a true fan like me. I'll link the archive scans in the description. N64 Tech Demo. Back when FF7 was still going to be developed for the N64, our boys at Square made this tech demo with characters from FF6 fighting this rock monster. It's pretty cool. Car Ad FMV and Shinra Building. When the team raids the Shinra Building at the beginning of the game, you can take a little detour and watch the most ominous car ad of all time. Rude won't attack Tifa. As you find out at Gongaga, Rude has a bit of a crush on Tifa and this actually shows through during gameplay. During your fights with him, Rude will never attack Tifa unless he doesn't have a choice. What an absolute king. Bugenhagen worked for Shinra. It's true, everyone's favorite floating green man actually used to work for Shinra. Ketchi tells you at some point, but I honestly don't remember where. Tifa and Sid can also chocobo race and snowboard. If you have either Tifa or Sid in your active party while participating in the super fun, totally not bad chocobo racing mini game, they'll randomly ask to give it a shot. The same goes for snowboarding. This doesn't have any bearing on the game mechanically. No way and off course. These are another two classic typos in the translation script. When asked if you want to go to the next round during the arena game in the gold saucer, your answer choices are either off course or no way. Further adding to my theory that this game was proofread by actual gorillas. Barrett didn't found Avalanche. Something that's way more obvious in the remake. Barrett's team is only an extremist subsection of the insurgents group Avalanche. A lot of the Avalanche groups have kind of split off to do their own thing. This is something the original game never really alludes to. Sephiroth was originally Aerith's brother. In the early design drafts of FF7, Sephiroth is going to be Aerith's brother. You can still kind of tell from the whole hair thing they got going on. Vincent's age. Vincent Valentine is physically in his late 20s during the events of the game, but this hot topic ass bitch is chronologically 57 after he sealed himself away in a coffin for 30 years. Hidden scene at the ancient city. This is an obscure cutscene found in disc two and can only be found after Cloud recovers from his little episode and joins back with the gang once again. By going back to the ancient city, a place you aren't prompted to go back to yet, you get this interesting scene of old Thunderhead reflecting on our girl Aerith and his experience with the live stream. Midgal's Motors. This is another typo that can be found in one of the game's pre-rendered cutscenes. If you notice the cute cyan truck the party uses to escape Midgar with, you can see that the emblem reads Midgal's Motor Group. <laughs> Sephiroth's relationship with Gast. Even though it says on the wiki that Sephiroth has a respect for Professor Gast, it's basically unclear if Sephiroth even met the guy or not. Maybe as a child, or maybe by reading all those confidential files, he just knew him through that. Who knows? Yeah. Red Submarine. If you fail the submarine minigame, it actually opens up a new event where you can steal a red one from the Junon dock instead. It sucks because most people will never know this because of how piss easy the submarine minigame is. It looks kind of fire in my opinion. Fort Condor Bad Ending. Fort Condor is an optional area where you can play a real-time strategy game that involves protecting your tower from enemy forces. I assume the bad ending is referring to how if you fail, you're forced into a boss fight with the CMD Grand Horn. Tobal No 1 FF7 Demo Disc. Resident Mediocre PS1 fighting game Tobal No 1 included a demo disc for FF7. The demo is noticeably different than the final game. For one, there's this opening text crawl in the void at the start of the game, the music is slightly different, and Cloud is just way more pissed. Tofering. This is an accessory that can be stolen from Reno when you fight him on the sunken Galinka. It probably goes without saying, but it's supposed to be toughering, but you know, monkey. 
Zongen. Zongen is a minor character that taught Tifa and 128 other students across the world martial arts. This champ also helped Cloud rescue survivors when Sephiroth lit Nibelheim on fire. What an absolute mad lad I didn't even know existed. Loveless is a real My Bloody Valentine album. Loveless is a stage play in the universe of the game that you can see the poster for in the opening FMV. But what you might not know is that Loveless is a reference to the album of the same name by indie rock band My Bloody Valentine. Their band name is actually written down on the side of the poster. Kefka Laugh and Ghost Hotel. If you talk to the funny jack-o'-lantern men in the gold saucer spooky ghost hotel, you can hear a slowed down version of Kefka Palazzo's laugh from FF6. <laughs> FF7 and Coconut Fred. Have you ever heard of Coconut Fred, the 2005 Teletoon TV show? Well, in episode 22, Sir, Sir Nut a lot, the protagonist Coconut Fred pulls out his Fire Cloud Strife cosplay. Just, just look at the guy. FMV inconsistencies. There's a couple of strange inconsistencies in the FMV cutscenes. We've already talked about old Midgal's motors, but there's also some wacky shit in the Aerith death cutscene. In the first few shots, Sephiroth isn't wearing gloves, then suddenly he magically is. Or look at this, even though Cloud laid her body down in shallow water, she floats like 100 leagues under the sea. Xenogears reference. If you talk to Cloud over here while he's going through his live stream hangover, he just spouts a bunch of gibberish. But sometimes he'll say a billion mirror fragments, small, light, taken, angels, singing voices, Xenogears. This is an incredibly unsubtle reference to Square's other JRPG, Xenogears. Cloud and Aerith and WoW. In the World of Warcraft expansion Legion, you can find these two NPCs that bear a striking resemblance to two people we know and love. Aww. Laughing in 500 years late scene. The after credit scene shows Nanaki and his cubs coming across the remains of Midgar 500 years later. However, after the logo appears, there's this black screen where you can hear creepy ass children's laughter. I think I blocked this out of my memory, Cloud's Antenna. Hmm. I'm not sure I know what this could possibly be alluding to. I have no godly, earthly idea, guys. Reeve's parents at the Honey Bee Inn. If you look through one of the keyholes at the Honey Bee Inn, you can see an old couple talking about how their son rented out a room for them. It's heavily hinted at through their dialogue that their son is Reeve Tuesti, head of urban development at Shinra and the controller of Ketchi. 135 scale soldier. This is an item that does absolutely nothing. You can win it as a prize at the Speed Square, or find two in Junon by just taking a look around. People thought that you needed to collect 35 for something cool to happen. Like, I don't know, Aerith coming back to life. Pizza Hut and Domino's name puns. When your party's in the Shinra building, you meet Mayor Domino and his assistant Hart. Hart could also be translated as Hut. So basically you got Domino's and Pizza Hut. Good to know that Sakaguchi likes pizza the chains as much as I do. Secret cow level. This is an easter egg in the 2012 re-release of FF7 on PC that you can find if you use the save crystal in this exact room in the final area. It saves your location as the secret cow level. This is a reference to Diablo and its hidden level Moo Moo Farm. Mount Colt's Billboard. In Sector 8 of Midgar, it's really hard to see, but there's this poster advertising a place called Mount Colt's. This is a callback to an area in the last game, The Maiden Who Travels the Planet. This is a novella written by Benny Matsuyama that details Eros point of view immediately after her death. She meets up with the spirits of the other deceased characters in the game and helps them to move on. While I'm not entirely sure if it's canon or not, the hot boys and girls over at the livestream.net actually made an audiobook for it that I'll link in the description for those that are interested. Ghost square bat when pressing L1 R1 circle. Going back to the spooky ghost hotel, there's another easter egg that can be found in the courtyard by pressing L1 R1 and circle at the same time. It makes this cool ass bat fly across the screen. In character diary entries in FF7 Kaitai Shinsho. Sometimes referred to as Final Fantasy VII Dismantled, it's a book that came out very close to the game's release. It contains a bunch of supplementary material about the characters, along with diary entries that dive into how everyone was feeling at certain points of the plot. I don't think these have ever been translated to English. Original version of Honey Bee Inn. The optional location Honey Bee Inn was originally going to be way more raunchy, if you can believe it. There's an unused reception room with various pictures of women, along with the price for their, let's just say, various services. Basically the idea that the Honey Bee Inn was a brothel was going to be way more obvious. Unused text. Unsurprisingly, there's a ton of completely unused text found in the game's code. I assume a lot of it got removed because Square thought they were unnecessary. I'll link the cutting room floor page down below if you want to take a look yourself. Red Man and Corral Prison Hole. Finally we get to talk about my homie Red Man. If you 
go down the hole in the Corral prison, you find this empty chest. However, hidden in the layer underneath it is this cute red figure. It's mostly unknown what purpose he could have served or why he's chilling under an empty chest, but there are theories. It could be a background artist's special signature, but I'm not sure. FF7 on NES. Okay, get this. There is a Chinese bootleg released in 2005 that demakes the entirety of FF7 to fit on an NES cartridge. Despite the game looking like complete ass, it's honestly mind-blowing what Shenzhen Nanjing technology was able to achieve. I don't know who the hell had the time for this, but it's been translated into English and the ROM is available to download online. Chest covering unused background elements. In this tower in Calm, there's a chest that contains a gun for Vincent. But interestingly enough, this chest right here is actually covering up an unused side quest pertaining to this bookshelf. Looking at some of these cut backgrounds shows that the books were originally able to be removed. There's a similar case at the seashell house where Cloud has his little slumber party. There's a chest blocking a door that was clearly meant to be opened at some point. Mystery panties. This is an unused item that the player would have obtained during the wall market cross-dressing section. I assume the segment where you got them was cut along with the other Honey Bee In content for being too icky. There's a ton of text I found of Cloud trying to figure out a way to ask for them like a total creeper. Please, lend me your panties for a dangerous mission. I like you. Won't you please give me your panties? We hit the jackpot! Yes, I made an iceberg video on the JRPG Final Fantasy VII. Can you please show me to your bedroom? Secret Cave in Ancient City. On the last screen of the forest leading to the Forgotten Capital, there's some vines that lead to an inaccessible cave that the player would have more than likely been able to go to at some point in development. Letter to wife slash letter to daughter. In the year 2000, this dude named X Sephiroth 1 used his Game Shark to discover two unused items, these being letter to wife and letter to daughter. We'll be back to this very shortly. Original resolution backgrounds. When the pre-rendered backgrounds were put into the game, they obviously faced a ton of compression to fit on PS1 discs, but with the power of machine learning, fans have actually been able to restore these backgrounds to their original resolution and mod them back into the game itself. They look pretty good if I do say so myself. Unused fields. There are a ton of unused backgrounds and field maps in the game. Here's a a short montage of them that I found on the livestream.net. Traveling Salesman. There's an unused side quest involving a traveling salesman in Gungaga. He would have actually had to deliver the letter to wife and letter to daughter items to their destination. The salesman dialogue is still translated and in the game's code. Fourth disc in Japanese international version. Japan got an updated release of FF7 that included all the changes made in the international versions of the game. What's interesting though is that it came with a fourth disc that never saw the light of day in other markets. It's got a guide, a database of concept art, a world map that lets you check out all the areas and items, a model viewer, and even some beta footage. This shit is so fascinating, bro. I could probably squeeze out an entire video on this alone. Different save icon in each memory slot. Depending on which slot you save your game on, there'll be a different character for the save icon. Slot one is Cloud, two is Barrett, and so on and so forth. Debug rooms. Deep within the darkest depths of FF7, you can find an extremely detailed debug room by entering in Game Shark codes. I won't lie, it's kind of spooky. The whole thing is like this creepy black void with the character model standing around ominously. We'll come back to this later too. Aerith text in the Great Glacier. By using Game Shark to bring Aerith to the Great Glacier, she has a line of dialogue that says, I'm sick of this. This is really weird as, at this point in the story, she had died not too long ago. The map author probably didn't know if she was going to be dead or not at that point, so the text is still in the game's code. Trap. This is the name of one of the many unused maps we were talking about before. Until May of 2014, people had no idea what it actually looked like. All fans had to go off of for a while was a texture rip with a bunch of graphic tiles just thrown all over the place. But with the efforts of a dude named Brutal Al, it was finally rearranged into what we see today. Black Materia and the Icicle Inn Weapon Shop. In the Icicle Inn Weapon Shop, there's an inaccessible flight of stairs that has a Black Materia model just sitting there menacingly. It doesn't really do anything and was probably just a placeholder for an unfinished asset or something. Cloud and FF Tactics is canon. Strap on your tinfoil fedoras, everyone, because we're going in. In the spinoff game Final Fantasy Tactics, Cloud is featured as a guest character and you can even recruit him to your party. What's really weird, though, is that the FF7 Ultimania book treats his inclusion as canon to the original game storyline, like he was actually pulled 
out of his world and isekai'd into tactics after the Northern Crater incident. Okay, Square. Obstinate Melon's webcomic. Obstinate Melon is a digital artist who's been making this fire retelling of the FF7 plot in comic form. Their art is awesome and I highly recommend sending some love their way. God, it makes me so happy that people are still so passionate about this stupid game so much. Their DeviantArt page is linked down below. Johnny isn't actually Cloud's childhood friend. Because of some shoddy translation in the original game, the character Johnny seems to be a childhood friend of Cloud's, even though this isn't the case at all. They were never actually friends. Childhood friend is really a nickname Johnny gave Cloud because he's thirsty for Tifa, and he knows that Cloud and her were in fact childhood friends. He says it in like contempt, you feel me? All of the characters were supposed to die in the raid on Midgar, but the three in your party. In Polygon's Final Fantasy VII and Oral History, you can read a conversation character designer Tetsuya Nomura and director Yoshinori Kitase had. I'll read it out for you. Did you know people have been coming up to me for years now and saying, you killed Aerith? Are you trying to blame me for that? Okay, so maybe I did kill Aerith, but if I hadn't stopped you, in the second half of the game, you were planning to kill everyone off but the final three characters the player chooses. No way, I wrote that? Where? In the scene where they parachute into Midgar. You wanted everyone to die there. Really? Wait, I'm starting to remember. Yeah, remember? You and Nojima-san were all excited about this. I was the one who said no way and stopped you guys. You wanted to kill everyone except the final three characters the player chose for the endgame. I take back everything I said about you, Namara. FF7 CG Collection DVD. This is an extremely rare and expensive DVD released by Toshiba when the original game came out. It shows off the uncompressed FMV cutscenes in all their glory along with a making of documentary. Thankfully there is a 1080p upload on YouTube for everyone to enjoy. Cloud and Tifa have sex under the high wind. That's right ladies and gents, the title says it all. Right after the Midgar raid, Tifa and Cloud share a beautiful moment together underneath the high wind before it's heavily implied that they sleep with each other. Originally they were going to make it way more obvious but they decided to dial it back a bit. Well, the LTD debate is over guys, pack it up. Test Zero. This is referring to a test enemy hidden within the game's files. In most regions, the enemy can only be fought using cheat devices and is displayed as a yellow pyramid. In Japan though, the enemy can actually be fought normally in the Corel prison hole. It doesn't even fight back or anything. All they do is say, it hurts and ask for you to stop. That's some creepypasta shit right there. PS3 tech demo. Back when the PS3 just came out, Square put out a tech demo showcasing what exactly they could do with the hardware. They made this dope ass recreation of the intro of FF7 and everyone just nodded simultaneously. People thought it meant a remake of the game was in the works, but Square quickly shot it down. If only they knew what was lurking just beyond. Ketchi is a third limit break. There's a glitch in the Japanese version that makes it look like Ketchi is a third limit break, when in reality, he only has two. European manual memory card ad uses unused map background. This memory card ad seems innocent enough, but if you look closer, its background is actually an unused field map by the name of Hyo 14. It depicts an icy waterfall that was likely going to be used for the Great Glacier. Cloud's original design was used for Zack. In the first design drafts for Cloud, he had dark slicked back hair. Not only did this look pretty cool, but it also saved on polygon count. Man, I bet this bitch thought he was so cool. When Cloud eventually got his new cut, they didn't want to throw out his old design, so they reused it for the character Zack Fair. Creepy version of the Junon gas chamber. Remember that scene where Tifa has to escape from a gas chamber? Older concept art shows that it was going to be way scarier. It honestly makes no sense why the room would look like that, but that's probably why they changed it. Yuffie and Vincent original roles. The basic idea for Yuffie at first was that she was going to be a 25 year old bounty hunter searching for Cloud and Sephiroth. On the other hand, Vincent jumped around a lot before landing on the edgy vampire man we know today. Most notably, he was going to be a detective hired by a rival company to take down Shinra. After he would try to save Lucrecia from Hojo, he would have put Vincent to sleep for 30 years after experimenting on him. So in that regard, their backstories are a little similar. Red 13 clones. Older concepts for the character Red 13, or Nanaki, show that he was actually going to be cloned by Professor Hojo. These two clones would be named Cobalt 13 and Indigo 13. No reference to this exists in the final game. Vincent dances when Aerith dies. There is an incredibly unfortunate bug that can happen in the cutscene right after Aerith dies. As everyone is paying their respects, Vincent just comes in and does what I guess kind of looks like a dance? Whatever it is, it's incredibly inappropriate considering his friend just died. Genova originally a psychic power. The Final Fantasy VII Ultimania Omega revealed that in earlier drafts of the game's story, Genova was in fact not a purple space monster, but a certain region of the human brain that can awaken and give the person superhuman abilities. Square ended up reusing this concept in other games. Did Soldier exist before Sephiroth was born? Considering that Soldier consists of what are essentially human experiments, and that the creation of Sephiroth and the Genova project were controversial, it really 
really begs the question of which came first. Did the Genova Project give Shinra the idea to experiment on human beings for the purposes of militarism? I have no idea. Parasite Eve is inspired by an early draft of FF7. Super early on in development, I think when 7 was planned to be on the Super Nintendo, the game was going to take place in modern day New York City, where you would play as hot-blooded Detective Joe. The setting and some concepts were later reused in the survival horror RPG, Parasite Eve. Barrett was originally going to die instead of Aerith. Square knew that they wanted one of the party members to die early on in development. At this time, the only party members they could choose from were Cloud, Aerith, and Barrett. Cloud was ruled out pretty quickly, but there was some deliberation for the other two. Of course, Aerith ended up being chosen. Supernova Math. When Sephiroth casts his iconic supernova attack, you're forced to watch in terror as it destroys the entire solar system before reaching the party. If that wasn't enough, he also starts flexing his mathematical formulas on you, adding to the sheer horror of the attack. Aerith and Tifa were originally one character. The next two pieces on the iceberg are in reference to an early character relationship chart. It shows that the only party members available at this time would be Barrett, whose name is Blow, Cloud, and Tifa. If you recall back, I was saying that the only characters at the start of development were Barrett, Cloud, and Aerith. So with this in mind, and the fact that her and Sephiroth are shown to be siblings at this point, it can be inferred that Tifa and Aerith were one and the same character early on. Hope that made sense. This is like rocket science. Sephiroth originally had Vincent's design. Going back to this chart, you can see that Sephiroth looks almost exactly like what Vincent would later look like. It also shows that he was going to be part of the three lost beings and best friends with Cloud. What was the world government before Shinra? Shinra has such a tight grasp on the planet's government and politics during the game that it really makes you wonder what it was like before they showed up. The Setra clearly had their own thing going on before Shinra, but we're never really given any information on that. FF7 and FF10 take place in the same universe. For the longest time, this was a popular fan theory that tied the world of FF10 to 7. In 10-2, the sequel to 10, you could find this scientist man named Shinra, who is researching the concept of using a planet's life power as an energy source. The more I study it, the more fascinating it gets. There's limitless energy swirling around in there. Limitless energy? The life force that flows through our planet, I think. With a little work, we could probably extract the energy in a usable form. Theories say that he went to another planet and created the Shinra Electric Power Company, and the rest is history. Kazushige Nojima, a scenario writer for the series, was being all cheeky about it, and basically confirmed this idea in the FF7 Ultimania. What's more, a picture of Shinra, the guy, not the company, can be found in the Shinra Buildings Museum. Yep. It's confirmed, Frosted Tips Bitch Boy shares the universe with Thunder Twink, Aerith Apparition. People wanted Aerith to come back so bad that their brain rolled her to be so. Connection between ugly video game and the human brain became one, earthing what can only be described as the Aerith Apparition. Emerald and Ruby Items in the versus guide we talked about forever ago, there was this error that wasn't fixed till later prints. It claims that for beating the emerald and ruby weapons, you are rewarded with an emerald and ruby item respectively. This of course is false, as you actually get the desert rose and earth harp items for beating them. FF7 takes place on earth. While Sephiroth is casting supernova, the attack destroys Pluto, Jupiter, and makes a sun explode before the attack reaches you on earth. Was that just a psychedelic sequence for show? Or does this mean that the world of the game is in fact earth? Real baby named Sephiroth. This one makes my spine tingle. In 2006, a beautiful baby boy was born into a family in Oak Ridge. And how did they repay him? How did they show their undying love? They named him Sephiroth. God, I really want to express my condolences to this guy. Like, what does he do when people ask him his name? Yeah, it's a... Uh... Sephiroth. The FF7 house. Do not research in the Sarah saga. This refers to a real life horror story of a man who gets coerced into moving in with these unhygienic, disgusting, abusive people who sincerely believe that they are characters from Final Fantasy 7 in another lifetime. Or more accurately, they believe that the characters' souls inhabited their bodies. Here, they would begin to reach out to others, assigning them characters from the game whom they believed were soul bonded to them. They found success convincing the mentally ill, the mentally handicapped, and the psychologically or emotionally vulnerable. The Sarah Saga details the antics of another one of the story's characters, sort of a spin-off if you will. This is a truly disturbing and fascinating story I highly recommend checking out. There's an excellent down the rabbit hole video I watched on it that I will link down below. Oddheader video. Oddheader is a YouTube channel that makes stuff about video game easter eggs and various other discoveries. On April 1st, yeah I know, he uploaded this video saying that an over 20 year old Aerith revival easter egg has finally been found. 
He does all this really specific shit, and sure enough, she comes back from the dead. I didn't know this video was a joke at first, so when it got all freaky, it spooked me a bit. That being said, it's a fun video that you should watch if you're in the mood. How do they know what Texas is? There's a sign above the bar, 7th Heaven, that says Texas on it. How the hell do these people know what that is? There's a similar situation where Cloud can order Korean barbecue at a different bar. It was probably just a design oversight. Ben Lansing. This is a dude who ran a huge internet hoax back in the late 90s, stating that, you guessed it, Aerith could be brought back to life. Throughout the past few weeks, I, myself, have been wondering why people are having such a hard time reviving Eris. Because according to everything I saw through the scenario translation process, it could be done fairly easy. These were the early days of the internet, so nobody could fathom he was joking. 99 tissues. The tissue is a pretty useless item in the game. However, there might be more behind it than it lets on. Quoting from a forum post on the subject, it refers to the dramatic tears everyone shed for the loss of their one and lovely Aerith. The side quest is a little tough. When you gather 99 tissues, complete the Aerith ghost side quest, and play the secret Highwind incident where Tifa kills herself, you go to the church and Aerith comes back to life, and she gains the FF7 equivalent to a nuclear strike as her new weapon. Really? No. Hull House evolved to prey on homeless slum dwellers. The Hell House enemy you fight in the Midgar slums just seems like a goofy enemy, but when you really think about it, it's kind of messed up. Hell House uses its exterior to lure homeless slum dwellers inside so it can eat them. Damn, I just thought Nomura was high on crack or something. The planet's name is Gaia or Gaia. During the course of the game, the planet is simply referred to as the planet. But in E3 2004, in a poster for the movie Advent Children, it specifies the planet of FF7 as the world of Gaia. In other releases and promotional material since, it's continued to be called Gaia. Gaia is also the name of the planet in FF9, so that kind of muddies the water a little bit. Dick Tree. Back in 2012, a forum user named Dick Tree decided to take on the mind-numbingly boring task of leveling up Cloud and Barrett to level 99 in the first area. Eventually, he lost enthusiasm for this quest and stop charting his progress, much to the dismay of other forum users. That was when our hero Circle Master entered the fray and kept the dream alive when Dick Tree pussied out. After grinding for a staggering 525 hours, Circle Master actually did it. So brace yourselves, I'm gonna hit it. And there it is. And it's gone. In this Twitch, I have gotten Cloud and Barrett to level 99 in the first reactor in Final Fantasy VII. Hojo.org. This has to do with the FF7 house story we were talking about before. One of the first people to contact the OP in that story was the shady character who went by Hojo, who owned the website Hojo.org. The website is down now, and when I visited it, I think it tried to give me a virus. The Knights of the Round are the ancients who sealed away Genova. There's a lot of speculation on the lore importance of the ultimate summon, the Knights of the Round. One theory states that they were in fact the ancients who sealed away Genova when she tried to destroy the planet. Reno in the opening FMV. For the longest time, people thought that this dude right here in the opening FMV was Reno, because his jacket is kind of similar. But after we got higher resolution versions of the scene though, it's pretty easy to tell that it's not him. Vincent is Sephiroth's real dad. We all know that Sephiroth was the baby of scientists Lucrecia and Hojo, but what if I told you Hojo wasn't the real father? It could be inferred that Vincent was already romantically involved with Lucrecia before she went to Hojo, so what if Sephiroth is actually Vincent's child? It would make sense. For one, they look and act way more similar. I'm sorry, but you can't look at me and say that this thing made this. Beating the final opponent in the 3D Battler. I'm sure you're familiar with the 3D Battler at the Gold Saucer Arcade. It's complete bullshit and practically impossible to win at a certain point. There are five opponents you you can fight. And to even get to the fifth one, you have a culminating chance of 0.0003%. If you somehow actually get there, the fight is completely impossible. That didn't stop this rumor from spreading that if you actually did beat the final opponent, this dude right here would challenge you. Probably not though. Silver Chocobo. This is the most famous Chocobo rumor of them all. So hold on tight guys. It says that if you breed two S-Class Chocobos together, there is a very small chance you could receive a silver one capable of traveling underwater. This isn't true at all, but at least you can recruit a silver Chocobo to your party in Final Fantasy 13. Too. Zach is the guy who are sick in the pipe. Remember the men in the Midgar slums who are sick? Could that possibly be Zach, who faked his own death and went into hiding? Maybe the Mako poisoning finally got to him. This one is a stretch, as Aerith dated him at one point and didn't of course recognize the man as Zach, but who knows? The General. Coming from the Ben Lansing articles, the General is a crucial part of the Aerith revival process, and the true name of the man who are sick. He would have given you a yellow materia that would allow Cloud to go through the water to Aerith's body and subsequently bring her back to life. Tifa dying instead of Aerith 
Earth's secret. This is another rumor that states if you're really nice to Tifa, never allow her to die once in battle. She will jump in front of Sephiroth's katana and save Aerith. Thank God this was the last topic about bringing Aerith back to life. Do these people not understand what death means? Genova was controlling Sephiroth the whole time. It's true that the party were really searching for Genova the first half of the game, before Sephiroth's real body made its appearance. However, is it possible that Genova's cells had enough power over Sephiroth to be controlling him the entire game? Hey, that could explain why he loves talking about how great Mommy is all the time. Cloud and Chocobo Racing is canon. Not many people are aware of the PS1 spin-off game Chocobo Racing. And even less people know that you can actually unlock the secret character Cloud Strife on his bike, the Hardy Daytona. You're gonna have to bear with me for a moment, but if Cloud and Tactics is canon, then who's to say that Cloud in this kart racing game isn't? I'm just saying, bro. FF7 banned by the DHS in the US. In 2005, the Department of Homeland Security placed a ban on all sales of Final Fantasy VII in the US in light of recent terrorist attacks. Seeing how Cloud is working with terrorists to blow up a reactor at the beginning of the game, it's not surprising that they would take issue. Actually, nah, get pranked. This comes from a joke post on an IGN forum that's obviously completely fake. Humanity was destroyed by Holy. Holy is the ultimate white magic spell, meant to cleanse the planet of all threats. Aerith ends up casting this in the Forgotten City, and along with help from the livestream, the world is saved at the last moment. All the characters are enveloped in a flash of light and the game ends. But what if in an effort to cleanse the world of all threats, Holy actually destroyed humanity to protect the planet? The humans, after all, had been draining the livestream for centuries. If you take the spin-offs and sequels out of the equation, this could be a real possibility. FF7 was a collaboration between Square and Sony to destroy Nintendo. We all know that after shifting development to the PS1, Square and Nintendo had a, let's just say, dramatic falling out. Even before that though, Nintendo constantly impeded on the creative freedom of the companies who made games on their platform. So what if Square and Sony, fueled by hatred and malice, created FF7 to destroy Nintendo? I guess we'll never really know what went on back then. 10 Sephiroth. Okay, this is talking about a massive analysis you can find on the livestream.net, where the writer discusses certain parts of FF7 and how they could connect to the 10 Sephiroth, a Kabbalist religious symbol. If this kind of stuff gets you going, I linked it for you. I'm not gonna deep dive into this if that's what you're hoping. This thing is kinda long. Sephiroth infects Cloud with Red Lifestream. When Cloud finally beats Sephiroth with Omni Slash, the cutscene afterwards seems triumphant, but upon further inspection, you could see this Red Lifestream substance come out of Sephiroth and absorb into Cloud. That bitch might have just cursed our boy in his dying breath. Once you've noticed this, it's hard to unsee it. Cheese Weapon. This is an incredibly outlandish rumor that can be found on the obscure FF7 rumors site I'll link below. It states that if you do a bunch of really specific stuff, you could eventually go to the moon and fight a super boss called the Cheese Weapon. This whole paragraph is nonsense, but at the same time, I'm glad that I know of its existence, and now you do too. This is Hades. Remember the creepy debug rooms? The ones with the ominous, floating, ugly PS1 character models chilling in the black void? Well, there's one room I wanted to show you. Going up to this enlarged Aerith model will play the scream sound from the ghost hotel. And after that, if you talk to her and choose to Hades, she replies with, silly. Didn't anyone tell you? This is Hades. Basically, this is a cheeky way of the devs saying these debug rooms are hell. The entire game is Aerith's future vision. The very first shot you see in the game is Aerith's face. Skip ahead to the very end, you see the same shot. This could very well mean that the events of the game never happened, and that they're all just Aerith's premonition. This may seem really stupid, but the remake actually gives this theory some leeway. Without spoiling too much, Aerith clearly knows things that she shouldn't. Almost like she's already played through the original already. Almost like she watched an over 30 minute long iceberg video on it. After summarizing fun facts and Aerith revival rumors for over half an hour, it's really important to give thanks to the friends who made my dream a reality. I want to once again give massive props to the Strife is Rife for helping me every step of the way. I would honestly be shit out of luck without his help, so I really gotta say thank you. I also want to give a big fat thanks to the Livestream.net and the FF7 Citadel for compiling so much useful information. Even so, if I messed up anything, make sure to lambast me in the comments so you can correct my wrongdoings. I'm not sure if I'm gonna make any more Iceberg videos after this, so I hope you enjoyed the ride and maybe even stick around for some of the other stuff I make. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and with that said, I never want to look at this stupid game ever again.